joining us for what we uh, believe will be a really uh, insightful and interesting uh, 90 minutes for this now, but we are very appreciative of your time. So uh, my name's Peter. Uh, the reason I'm talking is because I have the privilege of having a front row seat here today as the moderator of this uh, webinar being brought to you by the Catalytic Capital Consortium and Impact Europe. Um, and my role at Impact Europe is very fortunate to work, lead the work mobilizing foundations and philanthropy of which Catalytic Capital plays a, a large part. I'm also um, in the privileged position of being able to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of myself and other members of the team behind the scenes, uh, Philippa and Clara, who are actually doing the hard work and you'll see appear in the chat as well. Um, we are doing that slightly awkward thing where one person is talking and someone else is moving the slides. So there will be a little bit of judder. Um, so stick with us while we do that. But I also aware that as a moderator, you're not really here to listen to me. So you're here to hear from our, our six speakers, um, all of whom bring a great deal of uh, expertise and knowledge. Um, and also I realized as I joined this call today, we are actually fortunate to be joined by people from right across the uh, large part of the globe. So from Chicago, the East Coast of the US, uh, from India, from Central Europe. I myself am based in Hamburg at the moment. And I, I have nothing more to say than in this crazy world that we seem to be living in at the moment. It was just kind of a nice realization that there's people coming together from around the world to hopefully try and share some ideas and help move forward impact for those that, that might need it at this point. Um, I won't introduce them one by one, not least because I don't want to be intimidated by their resumes before um, uh, having to moderate them later. Um, we will be sharing links to all of these speakers uh, in the chat, and we will also uh, they'll all be able to introduce themselves when they present a little bit later. Um, just to place this, um, all five of, of our speakers uh, in our main body uh, were recipients of grants from the Catholic Capital Consortium and strengthening the evidence base. Uh, and so it'll be very interesting to see the insights that they bring forwards. Um, again, uh, moving on to the, the next slide, the other job that I'm here to do is to try and keep us on time because those insights that we'll be sharing will be very in depth and there'll be more than we can fit into the time we have here. So to give you an idea of what we're going to do as an agenda, we're gonna take a, a little bit of time just to explain why Impact Europe uh, and is very excited to be hosting this this website a lot, webinar sorry alongside the Catholic Capital Consortium uh, and also hear from the consortium themselves before going into the presentations I mentioned from each speaker uh, we'll have a short uh, presentation from each speaker and then we'll get into the meat of the plenary discussion as well to hear from all, all of the speakers from their unique viewpoints we'll follow that up with an audience Q&A and then conclusions and wrap up and hear from Ermi and the Catholic Consortium Capital Consortium uh, to close us out at the end of the session. Um, a little bit of housekeeping here. We are using Zoom, as you will have noticed. Um, feel free to use the chat uh, at the bottom of the, the screen, uh, both to say hello, um, but also to uh, register any questions you may have as we go along. I can't guarantee we'll ask all of the questions in this session. Um, they may not be relevant. They, they may be the greatest questions in the world. I may just get nervous and not actually see them. All of these things are possible. But what we will look to do is try and answer any that we couldn't in the session via email afterwards, if appropriate. Um, so please do feel free uh, to use that. And lastly, this session is being recorded and all the slides will also be shared via our website after this event. So feel free to actually uh, engage fully in our event today uh, without having to scribble down uh, 100 notes. Um, they will be available later on our website and we'll share a link with you and able to get there. Hopefully that all makes sense. Hopefully we're now all comfortable in the Zoom room. So I'm just going to take uh, no more than about two or three minutes to just explain why we're so excited uh, to be hosting this webinar here at Impact Europe. For those of you who don't know us, uh, Impact Europe is a membership organization of around 300 organizations that are committed to investing for impact. So we're a, a mixed membership. We range from corporations to UN agencies, from foundations to impact funds, but we're all committed uh, to trying innovation in pursuit of the greatest impact for our investments. Um, and so when we were first talking about Cassis of Capital um, two or three years ago, um, we did have a genuine bit of soul searching. We said, do we need uh, another term? Do we need to bring more 
more confusion to our market? Um, would our members find this useful in a European context? And just to be clear, our members, whilst linked to Europe, uh, are investing all around the world. And so we, we did exactly that. We brought a focus group together of around 75 to 80 members and others and tried to dig into what it meant to them and what, what they thought Catalyst Capital could bring to Europe as a, as a concept. Um, and so on the next slide, you'll see uh, a quote that came out from our, our focus group that I think summed it up quite nicely. Um, they, they defined it as Catalyst Capital addresses gaps left by mainstream capital in pursuit of impact for people and planet that otherwise could not be achieved. And that for us kind of nailed what we're trying to do as a network. Um, really, we're, we are in pursuit of impact for people and planet that otherwise could not have been achieved. But the reason why for us Catalyst Capital became uh, kind of crucial to this, and you'll see a quote there from our CEO about how it's more than just a program for us, is that Catalyst Capital doesn't just go into those gaps, but it also, in the majority of times, looks to actively bring others in behind it. So it's a pioneer that comes in and makes the way good for others. And so for us, we see this as the real fuel that we needed in the tank to, to drive a lot of the other investments and a lot of the other ways that our members wanted to try and have their impact. Um, so it's very simple that, that we saw a need for it. The second thing we recognized and our members found, and we had the fun of telling some of our members who had been doing work for 10, 15 years, that they were capital, capital providers, and they'd never realized this before, is we saw the need of being able to codify it a little bit to be able to research, to give strength to our members, to describe what they do in a way that could resonate with a wider audience. So we took on a challenge over the last two to three years, um, working with that community to build knowledge, build training. And as an impact-driven membership organization, there's two sides to what we do, really. So you'll see on the next slide, we've produced a number of uh, pieces of work that are available to, to you. And we would urge you to go to our website and if they're of use to you, please do use our, our white paper, our case studies, our quizzes, our, our articles, and, and hopefully they will help you, you move forward in your own uh, endeavors. But also as a membership organization, if you want to be involved in the future work that we're doing in 2025, shape this market, hear this voice, have your voice included, feel, do free, free, feel free even to reach out to us and we'd love to talk to you about joining the network. But this is not a sales pitch webinar. Um, just mentioning that because I have to. Um, but the next, uh, the other thing I wanted to draw attention to was none of this would have been possible without the support of the Catalyst Capital Consortium. And so when they asked us, would we like to co-host uh, this third of three webinars to highlight some of the other grantees in their program, we were very privileged to say yes. So that's really where I, I just wanted to stop. Hopefully that gives you some context of why we're here. Um, and hand over to Stacey from the Catalyst Capital Consortium to just take us uh, on a little bit and give a little bit of background from the consortium's point of view. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. And thank you uh, to the Impact Europe team for hosting this webinar. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar as well. Um, I'm Stacey Shao, as uh, Peter mentioned, I'm program officer for C3, um, Catalyst to Capital Consortium or C3 for short. Uh, just a little bit of background on C3. C3 is an investment learning and market development initiative that was launched in 2019 by the MacArthur Foundation in partnership with Omidyar Network and the Rockefeller Foundation uh, to promote greater understanding and more effective use of Catalyst to Capital among investors in recognition of the essential role of Catalyst to Capital in realizing the full potential of the impact investing field, including in achieving the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. Um, and C3 funded a cohort of 14 grantees that analyzed the uses of Catalyst to Capital across different themes, um, markets and regions around the world, uh, drawing from experiences from around the world, looking at outcomes and lessons learned, all to help strengthen the evidence base for the field. and. We wanted to hold a series of webinars to give these 14 grantees broader visibility to their C3 research projects. Um, the first webinar in the series was held in March by um, the Mission Investors Exchange and featured a subgroup of US-focused grantees within this cohort. Um, the second webinar was held in May by the African Venture Philanthropy Alliance and featured a subgroup of Africa-focused grantees. 
And today's webinar, as Peter mentioned, is the third and final webinar in our series. And so you'll hear from the remaining subgroup of grantees in this evidence-based cohort. This is um, an incredible group of grantees and we're very much looking forward to having you all hear from them on the important research work that they've done and their findings. Um, and one last thing before I turn back over to Peter, uh, we encourage you all to please visit the C3 website where you can learn more about C3 and the work of our grantees and partners. You can also join our community there as well and also sign up for our newsletter to stay in touch. Um, you can also follow C3 on LinkedIn if you'd like. Uh, we do have some exciting news from C3 uh, coming later this month. And so please look out for that news later this month on our website and social media. Uh, but thanks so much. And I'll turn it back over to Peter. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, and I like the trailing. Uh, exciting news to come. Always keeps people tuned in. Um, uh, really, my job now is, is to just hand over to, to our speakers. And what we're going to do is, is give each speaker sort of... Uh, five or six minutes to just come out with some of the insights of their work uh, and share some of their, their thoughts on their work as well. So you'll hear me occasionally popping up, uh, gently telling people that time is expiring um, and then moving on to our next speaker, but nothing else from me. So for now, I would just like to hand over to Michael um, to maybe take us through his, his project. Great, thanks, Peter. So I know the timer is running, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So my presentation is titled Catalytic Capital in Impact Investing Forms, Features, and Functions. Uh, next slide, please. This is just the, the title of the report that we produced with funding from, from C3. This is available online and, and provides a very high-level overview of, of catalytic capital. Next slide, please. Now, the report is based on a database called the Impact Finance Database, or IFD, which was built over several years by faculty and staff at the Wharton School of Business, Harvard Business School, and Chicago Booth. Uh, those three business schools put together what's called the Impact Finance Research Consortium, which is the entity that has managed the assembly and analysis of the IFD. Um, so the IFD has comprehensive survey and, and also other types of data on 222 impact investing funds across the globe, across investment strategies, asset classes, fund size, and other key variables. So again, this was designed to be a broad and, and high level perspective on the field of impact investing overall, not just in a, a particular sector or region. Um, in terms of the information in the IFD, we have data on investment strategy, impact measurement practices, investor investee relations, and a lot more. Next slide, please. One topic covered in the survey, unsurprisingly, is catalytic capital. So um, we had a module in the survey where we presented the respondent with C3's definition of catalytic capital and asked them essentially if that definition applies to the work that they do. Uh, if it did, we asked a variety of follow-up questions, including the kinds of catalytic capital they deploy, the reasons for doing so, how much they deploy, and from what sources. Now, in terms of analysis, this information allows us to get important insight on catalytic investors, but it also allows us to compare more catalytic and less catalytic or non-catalytic invest impact investors based on the data that we have on both groups and from other parts of the survey. So with all that said, let's go to some of the findings from our study. Next slide, please. The first finding is from a question in the survey that asked respondents how much of their committed capital they would classify as catalytic. Uh, again, based on the C3 definition we provided. And what we find here is a spectrum. There are, there are funds, 40% uh, of our sample, that do not do catalytic capital investing at all. And there are funds, nearly 20% of our sample, towards the right there, that are 100% catalytic. And then there's a range in between those two poles, about 40% of our sample, that has varying degrees of engagement. So these funds seem to have a sort of catalytic carve-out in their committed capital. So rather than thinking of catalytic capital as a binary feature of fund strategy, it makes sense to think of it as more of a continuum. Now, because we see the spectrum, we can see what higher levels of engagement with catalytic capital are associated with. And so I'll share some of those findings. Next slide, please. So we found that higher engagement with catalytic capital is associated with smaller fund size, lower likelihood of targeting market rate returns, higher likelihood of making debt investments, and more focus on emerging markets. Now, as you've probably already thought as I've gone down this list, these are not exactly groundbreaking findings. You know, it's, it's useful sometimes to get findings that confirm our intuitions, but these certainly are not big discoveries, right? As it turns out, the more surprising findings from this study are, are the non-associations. That is, 
we expected that higher engagement with catalytic capital would be associated with certain other fund characteristics, and those assumptions didn't hold up. So, so let me now go over those less intuitive findings, which are the non-associations. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It looks like we might have skipped a slide. Can you please go back really quickly? So yes, these are the these are the associations we found. Again, these are all pretty much intuitive. Please uh, go to the next slide now. And these are the non-associations that are less intuitive. So um, according to our survey findings, which are obviously based on self-reported data, higher engagement with catalytic capital is not associated with greater incentivization of impact performance, not associated with higher focus on impact fund, uh, impact during due diligence, not associated with more thorough impact measurement practices, and not associated with higher percentage of investees reported to have um, met or exceeded impact goals. Now, just to be clear, we're not saying that being more catalytic means that you're less likely to, uh, for example, focus on impact during due diligence. We just don't see any statistically significant relationship. And we have scales in the survey that, that measure each of these aspects of, of fund operations. So these findings were kind of surprising. And so we, we conducted interviews with staff at, at 21 funds that responded to our survey and self-identified as catalytic to try to understand what's going on here. Now, I don't have time to get into all the nuances here. I encourage you to read the report itself, but basically the people we interviewed made it clear that the relevant consideration when it comes to catalytic capital is not just how much impact you're having, but more so how differentiated or additional that impact is. So in short, in the survey, investors were drawing on their own standards for impact when evaluating their prioritization, measurement, and achievement of impact. And so to understand how catalytic capital investors achieve impact, we need to pay more attention to the, the sometimes subtle but important ways in which more versus less catalytic impact investors conceptualize the impact of their investments. That's important for field building. It's important for facilitating dialogue and collaboration. And it's important, frankly, for, for getting deals done. Um, next slide, please. So I hope that was interesting and helpful. I'll just wrap up by saying that in addition to the report itself, you can look up my, my piece in Impact Alpha, which offers some more takeaways from the report. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Michael. Um, I think, A, I'm quite impressed by the, the outcome of the, the work, but also by your keeping to time and uh, ability to shoot through so much data so well. Uh, you set the bar very high. Uh, you'll, you'll get invited back. Um, there's, um, and so just while we're digesting some of that, and I would just reiterate that all these slides will be shared after the, the webinar, because I do know we're, we're sharing quite a lot of information. So uh, do, don't worry about that. I'll just uh, very briefly hand over to, to Sarah to uh, pick up the, the baton from there. Thank you so much. And no pressure now that Michael's got an A plus right before me. Uh, my name is Sarah Carney, and I founded Prime Coalition based on my own experience serving as executive director and trustee of the Chisonas Family Foundation and my subsequent graduate research at MIT, where I interrogated philanthropy as a system. Um, Prime Coalition is in partnership with the Catalytic Capital Consortium both as a field partner that received catalytic investment across two of our catalytic funds, and also as a recipient of a grant to help strengthen the evidence base for catalytic capital. For the next six minutes, I've been asked to speak briefly about um, the outcomes of our evidence-based research, my observations about how the barriers to philanthropists deploying catalytic capital have evolved over the past 10 years, and what I see as opportunities for catalytic intervention to address acute capital gaps in climate. I'm gonna move pretty quickly because that's a lot. So please ask me about any of those topics during Q&A. Um, as you can see on this slide, Prime envisions a world in which humanity thrives without the threat of climate change, which is gonna require both climate change mitigation and climate adaptation while doing so in a way that addresses disparities in human thriving. Our strategies focus on both steering capital, where catalytic capital flows through us, and influencing capital, where we are providing resources to unaffiliated investment managers that allow for investment decisions that are optimized for climate impact. As you can see on this slide in the teeny tiny font, our three ex existing programs are venture capital, project finance, and impact accountability. Next slide. 
Over our first decade, we've been able to unlock over $315 million of catalytic capital through our steering capital programs. And we've completed transactions with over 360 philanthropic organizations and individuals across our steering and influencing capital programs. So that means we've been able to support 38 portfolio companies that each promise gigaton scale emissions reduction or removal and that wouldn't have been on the path to impact without us. Next slide. The outputs of our evidence-based grant from the Catalytic Capital Consortium included 32 files that we have available for free download from Prime's website. Um, we affectionately call it the Catalytic Capital Intermediation Resources Library. Try to say that 10 times fast. Um, we only shared this link upon request until two months ago, and there were still over 1,500 logins since we posted it. Um, Prime is frequently asked, how can I become the Prime of XYZ? And this library was our answer to that question. It's time stamped in 2022 but its guidance includes um, how to create a theory of change, how to substantiate a capital gap, guidance around pre-investment impact and additionality diligence. That's something that Michael just mentioned. Um, lessons learned about post-investment impact tracking and reporting, um, additionality in theory and in practice in a fund context. Um, Michael, who you just heard from, recently collaborated with Prime staff to help us update our additionality in theory and practice report, which we can share in the chat. Um, the library also includes templatized versions of Prime's legal agreements with a focus on how we've aggregated traditional grants, recoverable grants, and program-related investments on the money coming in to our steering capital programs. Um, these documents have been downloaded 400 times since we made the library public on our website just two months ago, and so I encourage you to check them out. Um, the library was built for intermediaries, but I think it, it, it holds really important insights for philanthropic asset owners as well. Uh, next slide. I think of the barriers for what makes catalytic capital difficult for philanthropists. I think of barriers in three buckets, educational, operational, and perceived regulatory barriers. I'm not going to linger on this slide in the spirit of time, but I will say that the challenges for philanthropists across these three buckets of barriers have definitely evolved over the past 10 years in ways that make me optimistic for a future where catalytic investing is a standard consideration for most philanthropists and also deeply grateful for the field building work that the catalytic capital Sarah, you're muted right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I was just saying we built Prime in 2014 as a nonprofit intermediary to specifically bring these barriers down to zero and unblock catalytic capital for climate. Next slide. What we needed to do back in 2014 was to co-create investment program. So this is where Prime came up with the fund hypothesis, substantiated the capital gap, considered all the corporate form options, recruited the investment team from scratch, did the fund formation work, did all the fundraising, and then implemented the program ourselves. What we're seeing now is that we might be able to unblock catalytic capital for climate by being less heavy handed ourselves working with even more impact first investment management teams by serving as a nonprofit aggregator that doesn't have to own substantiation, design, construction, or fundraising. So we're launching our next co-created program now, Trellis, as well as beginning to pilot a nonprofit aggregator service starting in 2025. Next slide. Um, my job as a moderator is this horrible moment of just sort of like, your, your time is starting to expire. <laughs> okay. uh... All right, great. All right, I'll zip through the last three slides. Um, we launched Prime Impact Fund and Azola Fund um, as co-created programs, and they targeted the innovation capital gap at the earliest stages of company formation. And we're launching our next co-creator program now. It's called Trellis. 
which targets the very acute capital gaps uh, when, when disruptive solutions need to build their first early facility or infrastructure project and can't yet attract traditional project finance. Let's skip to the very last slide since I can tell Peter is becoming increasingly anxious. Uh, if we look at the next step slide, um, this is, uh, this is this is for philanthropists if and there are three ways that you can engage with prime right now um one is that you can participate in this trellis pilot fund with a grant a recoverable grant or a program related investment the second is that we would love to hear more about the barriers that you're bumping into in an effort to deploy catalytic capital so we're partnering with a consulting firm called graham pelton conducting interviews around that set of questions over the next two months and then lastly, if you have a catalytic capital investment that you want to make in climate, please reach out and let's see if a US-based nonprofit intermediary can make that easier and more effective. Okay, Peter, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is why this is in some ways the worst job in the world because we have a lot of information to share and hopefully this works as a teaser, but it does feel like no one wants to hear me coming in and asking people to stop. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you very much, Sarah. And now just to move on uh, to the work of uh, Susanna in Central and uh, uh, Southeastern Europe. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so we, we were partners of the Catalytic Capital Consortium for the first time with this research. And uh, we are both geographically and sectorally focused. Uh, so this project is focused on the affordable rental and cooperative housing sector, which doesn't really exist uh, in this region and how catalytic capital could uh, be a key factor in kickstarting it. And regionally, we have a focus on Central and Southeastern Europe. So if we go on, um, one of the important things I wanted to to just point out uh, before I go into the content is that uh, this research was conducted by a pretty wide consortium of organizations that come from the region and work in the region. And uh, so the questions we were asking came very much from our practice, from our experience on the ground around, uh, around promoting new housing models. And so we saw that there is a, an unserved market uh, that there are target groups that are quite significant. Uh, and in spite of this, there are not, the new housing models do not develop and there's a lack of new housing finance instruments. And uh, so in the research, we really wanted to answer these questions that came from our practice. Um, so if we go on, yeah, that's just uh, the members of this consortium. And then the next slide shows a map of the countries that we covered in the research. And so these are European countries, some of them in the EU, some of them not. Uh, and uh, in this kind of work uh, around catalytic capital, I, I think there's a, a geographical black hole around Central and Eastern Europe, because it is generally seen as, a, as part of Europe, which has developed financial markets. But at the same time, actually, there are very significant differences within Europe. And so this is a region where catalytic capital could have a huge role and specifically in housing as well because uh, public actors are so so little present actually and and there is an increasing um, social demand and social need around this. Uh, so if we go on uh, to the key learnings, one of them is specifically about the target groups. Um, so we did a survey, a representative survey in these four capital cities that you see here. And well, the main finding is that there is a demonstrated need for new affordable housing solutions, which are not ownership based, but rental and cooperative based. Um, I will not go into the details of how this survey was constructed, um, but it was even for us, actually, it was quite surprising how big these potential target groups are. So it proved false that there's this fear often that actually if these new models were to develop, there would not be uh, appropriate reception for them. Um, our research proved that this is not true. There would be quite a big reception for them. And then also if you move on, um, uh, there's another myth uh, that, well, people in Central and Eastern Europe only want home ownership, where this is a myth that's quite common in different parts of the world, I think. Um, and uh, so we've also shown that this is not true. People actually want 
secure and affordable housing. And if this is uh, granted, then they are very happy to be uh, tenants or cooperative members. And so this is also something that's quite important in our context. And so if we move on, like if there is this demonstrated demand and it's so big, why uh, the market hasn't developed solutions to this or responses? And so the main uh, answer we found is uh, that the existing market structures are so different and there's the actors who are currently already present in this market are not willing to be pioneers or innovators. Um, and because the existing housing finance instruments are on the one hand individual mortgages, of course, but and on the one hand, short term construction for sale uh, project financing. There's, uh, there are high interest rates, fast turnover, it's a profitable market, of course, but it's a narrowing one. Uh, and uh, there's also a, an institutional capacity gap. Uh, so we identified, if we move on to the next slide, um, a catch-22 situation, let's say, where there are missing adequate patient financial instruments. So this, this was uh, the biggest um, uh, obstacle that we identified. So there are no financial instruments that would be long-term, low interest rate, um, yeah, patient finance, financial instruments. And the uh, financial actors who are dominating these markets currently, uh, they are not uh, willing to move into this. And as a result, uh, the sector also cannot develop because there are small scale new kind of housing providers who promote these models, but in the with the lack of these adequate financial instruments, they are not, not able to scale up. And so uh, there's a missing institutional capacity that persists. Uh, and so thinking about how we could move beyond this and how catalytic capital could become an enabler actually in bridging this gap, uh, one of our main results is that, uh, next slide, please, um, the, the importance of intermediary organizations, which is probably not very surprising in this, uh, in this sector, I mean, in, for this audience. Uh, and so these intermediary organizations could help in channeling capital towards the startup nonprofit housing providers and could also support them in capacity development. And uh, this, with this structure of channeling capital, even for, from uh, shorter term financial resources, could actually uh, bridge the lack of long term affordable finance. So we don't. We were trying to be pragmatic and to say that well, if there are no actors that would give like 25, 30 year financing, and then even if probably catalytic capital providers or many of them would not be willing to engage in such a long term. How could this be bridged and uh, and the use of intermediary organizations would be a potential solution to this. And so the question is who would provide the capital for these intermediary organizations, uh, which could even be regional because they uh, these are small countries we are talking about. So relatively small markets. So regional organizations would also have the benefit of uh, federating more, more uh, local housing providers. And so one of our, Practical examples for this or a mobile. I'm I'm going to lose more friends as well, but just to give you a, a little heads up on the on the time warning, I can Super. see my Christmas this... card list going down. <laughs> so... <laughs> this is actually my very last point. Uh, so, uh, one specific organization that we we have been building in the past years uh, in this spirit is the Mobile Housing SC, which is the European Cooperative Society, and. Um, which works on a regional level and where the main ambition is to build an internal quasi fund, uh, which we call the mobile accelerator and where the first step would be to to raise uh, grants or uh, uh, yeah, donations and the next step shares. Uh, and to build up this pool that would uh, that would be able to provide these kind of bridging loans and uh, and uh, supporting the capital gap that we have identified. So that is one specific way to go forward if uh, some actors would like to engage with this issue. Um, yes, so thank you for your attention. And on the last slide, mm -hmm. there are the links to the reports, uh, but I will also put them, oh no, Stacy already put them in the chat. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Um, well, one quick comment is if you want to host a webinar, I think any of these speakers would be worthy of a whole webinar on their own as I'm learning now. So do feel free to get in touch with them directly or get in touch with us and we'll happily put you, you in touch to, to hear more from all of them. Um, but while I'm in the, the bad man role of, of moving us along quickly, I will pass over to uh, Jay Shi. Uh, I even stopped being able to pronounce people's name. I will hand over and uh, uh, we'll hear from the next presentation. Thank you so you, much. You did well, Peter. I mean, you oh, didn't good. mispronounce the name. <laughs> this is still the end. Like I put some two extra slides oh. at the end of mine, but you can maybe skip forward. Yeah. yeah, I actually don't have slides, so I'm happy to just talk through, unless I think Stacy created some slides. Um, but I'm, I'm Jay Shri. I work with the Center for Financial Inclusion at Axion, and a lot of our work focuses on emerging markets and the consumer protection risks that emerge therein. Uh, so it's a bit of a shift from, um, you know, the previous presentations. I'm really grateful to both Impact Europe and the Catholic Cap Catalytic Capital Consortium um, for this opportunity to present here, but also work on this really important topic, because I started my career, um, or at the beginning of my career, I did have the opportunity to work on setting up a mezzanine fund. And, you know, this project combines my past life with my current life in a nice way. Um, so our research was completed about two years ago, but I think it's still quite relevant, particularly because we took a retrospective lens to understanding the evolution of the digital credit market in Kenya and the role that catalytic capital can play in responsible market building. Um, and when we think of uh, catalytic capital in the context of financial inclusion specifically, um, or digital credit, where you see a lot of fund flow, we tend to focus on the impact of investments at the institutional level. Um, but really, it's important to think about the amount of capital that is then catalyzed by initial investments and the distortions that that creates in market incentives, which can then create consumer protection risks at the market level. So why digital credit? Because we looked at funding patterns since 2015, and there's been a significant growth um, in the flow of funds to the inclusive finance uh, sector. I, th I think it's been growing at a CAGR of about 30%. Um, but you will see that credit gets the lion's share. And with fintech and digital lending, there's been a significant acceleration in funding to digital credit models. A big gap that we found and one that continues to exist is that um, funder and donor surveys don't really measure the volume or value of catalytic capital investments at the market level. Um, so what we did in our study is we looked at digital credit and we used Kenya as a case study, which was intentional for a number of reasons. It was the birthplace of digital credit without the initial support that had been provided by um, catalytic capital investments. Uh, we thought that, you know, the market wouldn't have seen the kind of growth that it did. And then a lot of the growth that Kenya saw uh, also had spillover effects in adjacent markets like Tanzania. So, I mean, just to give you a timeline of how Kenya grew, which is Safaricom and the Commercial Bank of uh, Africa launched Mshwari way back in 2012. And they knew at the point that success meant establishing a viable business case. And so the there was a savings and credit account that was issued by the by CBA, the Commercial Bank of Africa. Um, and that was linked to an M-Pesa mobile money account, which was then provided by Safaricom. And FSD Kenya provided catalytic capital to develop the business model, expand to new consumer segments, and then build a track record uh, to attract further investment. So they originally provided about $650,000 and then CBA invested $14 million. But what was interesting is that the whole model achieved break even within 11 months of product launch. And once that happened, digital credit in Kenya proliferated significantly. Um, but there were other things that did not happen as far as market development goes, which is Kenya had low entry barriers at that point. Uh, the lack of regulation at the time prevented potentially predatory lenders with little commitment to impact from entering the market. And by 2018, which is about five years after the business model was proven, Kenya had up to 50 digital providers. Um, and just to compare in 2014, there, there were just two. So on the consumer protection side, we saw challenges like high interest rates, over-indebtedness, aggressive sales practices, exploitative terms and conditions, deceptive fees, data privacy issues. So the whole gamut of risks. Um, so if we look at Kenya, and then we looked at a couple of other markets where there were positive examples. And we, we I mean, our, our thesis or our insight from this work is that the role for catalytic capital investors is a key point to consider. But we need to think about 
we need to think beyond the obvious role of catalyzing investments and how they can complement um, not just the investments that they're able to bring in, but the partnerships that they're able to create and appropriate development in institutions that can create adequate safeguards. And we also find that the role of catalytic um, investors shifts depending on the market maturity level. So in growth markets, there is a role for them to support businesses to either expand to new geographies or new uh, consumer segments. And with credit, I mean, you it's, it's easy to ask, you know, why do we need catalytic capital and credit? It is important because in the emerging market context, we have this interesting conundrum where there are several consumer segments and geographies that continue to remain underserved while others are oversaturated. So I think the role for catalytic capital investors is to push the needle to make sure that the underserved continue to you know, get access and are able to do well. Um, in other cases, I think the role is to enable access to debt capital, build capital markets responsibly or ensure adequate leverage. It could also be to develop new complex business models so that the consumer experience is more superior. And we see some of that coming through with embedded finance models um, in Africa. And then the last is to shape responsible markets, because I think it's important to preserve the impact of the initial investments made. Um, and, you know, there is a significant role that investors can play in that. Um, how am I doing on time, Peter? I think I'm I'm done with my points, but I'm happy to go into you, detail. You are perfectly on time. Um, okay. And I'm going to I'm going to give out some backstage gossip. It was it was actually a. Uh, you who, who mentioned that you'd like someone to nudge you in case you, you carried on a, a little bit too far and then you've nailed it perfectly on time that's yeah thank you so much <laughs> that, um, and we will delve into these uh, areas for more detail in the Q&A later so we'll hear from uh, Priya um, I, I hope uh, power outages uh, notwithstanding uh, and then we'll open this out since we're a smaller group to a, to a kind of more conversational platform so if you do have questions for any of the speakers please do uh, get them warmed up and get them ready um, and we'll put them on the spot. I mean, we'll share them with the speakers after Priya. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Um, I'm Priya, I head uh, 200 million artisans. Um, we are an ecosystem enabler and I won't get into that, but the idea of uh, what the research itself uh, discovered uh, in so many different ways uh, was uh, enlightening to me as well as my team, uh, as well as uh, uh, we, we were honestly glad that we were able to create the kind of uh, touch points that uh, investors could uh, draw from as well as um, enterprises could draw from. So very briefly, uh, what I'd like to share is that uh, thanks to C3, uh, we were able to do perhaps the largest mapping of financing uh, and the financing needs of craft-led MSMEs in India. So when I say craft-led MSMEs, uh, let me just very quick, quickly ask you a question, because I think the first thing when I say craft uh, is that uh, people think that it's an old woman making baskets in some part of the country. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, uh, and for, thankfully, uh, thanks to C3, we discovered that is not the case because uh, our data showed, uh, next slide please, uh, that there is a massive, massive opportunity to really uh, support an ecosystem that operates in the informal economy of India. And India is 1.4 billion people. Uh, and 95% of that economy operates in the informal economy. And so you and I, as what we see, uh, operating out of offices or out of formal, you know, social protections, insurance, all of that, that doesn't exist for 95% of the people in India. And 200 million people uh, operate out of craft and work, uh, you know, uh, have jobs linked with craft. And there are a few million uh, small enterprises, small businesses that also operate in this ecosystem. So when you're talking about scale, we are talking about 1.4 billion people and a few billion and a few million people operating with craft we just don't know and we don't talk about it because, um, you know, it doesn't seem big enough. Uh, and because there's no data, honestly, we can't uh, quantify it and it doesn't seem 
uh, you know, like a big uh, target market audience, as it were. So the impact opportunity that we discovered is that, again, uh, I'd like to ask everyone a question. Do you care? And Peter, maybe I'll ask you this one. Do you care about what you wear? Do you care about the books that you read? Do you care about the music that you uh, listen to? I'm glad you widened that because I thought it was a criticism of my blue shirt, but yes. No, no, <laughs> yes. no, 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 no. Yes. Uh, And the reason why I ask this question is because each one of us cares about what we wear, cares about the music that we listen to, cares about the books that we read, cares about a lot of things and the experience and the holidays that we choose to take. And I think we are a woke audience. And therefore, uh, I'd like to say that a lot of this is directly linked to the creative manufacturing and handmade ecosystem. So if you take a holiday in Bali, for example, you know, you are engaging with the creative manufacturing ecosystem. You are buying that shirt that looks, you know, is in a cut print. You are going to a hike that is supported by the local communities. And I'm trying to simplify catalytic capital and please allow me that space because um, when you work with organizations like that and when you're trying to engage with organizations like that on an everyday basis, there is an impact opportunity. However, they tend to be small. They are small businesses trying to build uh, and create value for their communities, not for the shareholders. And that is where the difference lies. And I think that is where the conversation on catalytic capital becomes very, very exciting for a sector like the creative manufacturing and handmade ecosystem. Next slide, please. And when I have to tell you how big the sector is, we are talking in India alone, you know, we are talking about a five trillion economy. We are not even talking. And if we have to follow the data, and if there is enough money to actually collect the data, uh, we are talking about a two trillion economy or at least a one trillion economy just for handmade in India. It is already uh, a one trillion economy globally. <clears throat> and which is why, and this economy exists in the global South countries and the global majority countries, which is India, Africa, Southeast Asia. And these are the communities and the countries that are also supplying to the things that we wear every day, you know, and that is what is exciting about this economy itself. Once again, when I say craft based enterprise, it is not this old woman making baskets. Yes, that old woman making baskets is supplying to an IKEA value chain, which is currently existing in India. And IKEA has a long-term strategy for India, for example. Uh, now, IKEA is in India. Walmart is in India. Uniqlo is in India. All these big companies are in India. And they are sourcing from our enterprises and the social enterprises. And that's what feeds into the social procurement yeah. conversation and feeds into the 5 trillion or the 1 trillion economy that is mo that we are talking about. Uh, next slide. And there is no one kind of craft-led yeah. enterprise, many, many, many kinds of craft-led, at least six that we identified as part oh, yeah. of our research alone, which was yeah. frankly ah. one of the, sorry, there is a uh, oh, yeah. well, 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 somewhere. Well, I can hear uh, a lot of other languages um, happening. And I'm also just going to jump in with my uh, un unfriendly warning about time as well. Uh, if we can okay. wrap that up Perfect. and bring it to yeah. the conversation, that'll be great. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> uh, and therefore, um, very quickly, uh, what we realized when we mapped about 516 MSMEs across the country uh, who took a 45 minute long survey uh, is that the biggest financing gap exists between. Uh, what we call an expanded mi missing middle. So the missing middle exists and we all know about it. But here is an expanded missing middle. And the biggest uh, challenge that a lot of these MSMEs face is working capital gap. They don't know how to run their enterprise. 88% out of the 516 MSMEs we mapped were self-financing their enterprises, not because they wanted to, because they didn't know how to go, where to go. 50% of those enterprises were women-led. 33% were committed to climate and sustainability, and 91% wanted catalytic capital, just did not know because there are no catalytic, catalytic capital solutions existing in the market. Um, next slide, please. Um, very quickly, uh, this also operates within the creative and cultural industries, which means this is a hardcore retail sector. 
So if you can see even where the capital is needed, you can't, a small business can't compete with the marketing budgets of H&M, for example, you know, and that is really where the challenge lies for a lot of these businesses that they are trying to do good, but they can't compete with what H&M is selling in the market. Um, next, I mean, this is all available in our research. The biggest, honestly, the greatest insight for me personally, uh, and I'm a creative person, I'm a storyteller uh, and a woman. Uh, the challenge for us was that I don't like working with Excel sheets and finance. You know, and financial literacy, therefore, becomes one of the biggest challenges when you are operating within the creative and cultural industries. And that is something that has been not intentionally addressed. Uh, we also do not have many cap catalytic capital investors in the sector, but that is changing because uh, there are a lot of people who do want to support the sector, but don't know how. Sorry, However, I, I know you don't like spreadsheets, but I, I'm terrified of the one that's in front of me keeping time. So I'm not a spreadsheet will, person either. So this is very awkward for me. But if we can. Uh, I will to try to. Wrap yeah. Up, thank thank you. you. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, the last bit of it is some of the uh, realizations that we've had post uh, C3 is one that it's not the that the enterprises in fact there are startups in the craft ecosystem and in fact i have somebody in the room uh, and i'm happy to share his link one of the case studies uh, so if you think that craft is not uh, does not involve technology we have vijaya uh, who runs kosha ai uh, who is one of the case studies in the room uh, who is driving um, you know conversations around uh, technology in the sector and there are many others who are driving technology and conversations around technology in the sector. What we would like to say is that because of this one research, uh, we have been able to then create something called Kula Conclave, which was one of the direct results of actually the C3 research, where people, uh, we were able to bring investors, funders together into the room with uh, enterprises who were looking for money and actually get them to talk to each other because this is a unique sector. That is one. The second thing that happened as a result of this is we were able to launch, launch Kula Innovate, which is one of the innovation capital remains one of the biggest challenges uh, in the sector because everybody thinks the sector is retail led. However, the minute we launched Kula Innovate, we thought we would get about 50 applications. We got 150 yeah. applications and we were able to unlock about $160,000, not just in cash prizes, uh, in catalytic prizes uh, that includes uh, catalytic debt as well as gap financing, which honestly we were surprised by the fact that the enterprises and small businesses were wanting to engage with this ecosystem was one of our biggest learnings. And one year down the line from the research, uh, honestly, that's what we have to share at this point. You can take it to the last Thank slide. You. Thank you. I, I feel really bad trying to cut people off and stuff, but the, okay. the only reason I'm, I'm doing it is because I was, I was so harsh with the people earlier that I then feel like, I would reiterate that any one of our panelists would be a worthy host of a webinar all on their own. Um, I don't particularly want to listen to my voice now. I'm a little bit lost. What I suggest we do is we stop this screen sharing since we're a smaller group and actually um, let's have a bit more of a conversation. So I'm not going to shut anyone up now. We're just going to move to a different talking kind of uh, uh, environment. And I would encourage those of you in the audience to feel free to start asking questions, uh, Think. I know we've just put you on the spot, so we've just come back from hearing everything from trillions to millions to billions, from craft to uh, impact investors uh, not getting impact, in, extra impact incentives. No, I've got that around the wrong way for Michael, but um, so there is quite a big range there. So what I thought might be uh, useful while you're all thinking and relaxing and coming up with smart sounding questions for our panelists is just to ask one or two questions um, uh, of our panelists now. And I, I was thinking about this and thought, I was struggling with this. So I thought I'd put our earlier panelists on the spot to do the work for me instead of doing it itself. I, I suppose coming to you, Michael, and, and possibly Sarah as well, like having listened to those that come after you with that relaxed air of having finished your own kind of presentation, I suppose what was, what, what really stood out for you about sort of interesting insights or sort of commonalities that we can see across, because it is quite a diverse 
portfolio geographically and scale wise. I don't know, Michael, if you have any kind of thoughts on the commonalities you're seeing. Um, I, I think that I might be stealing Sarah's point here, but I think it's clear that that uh, intermediaries play a tremendously valuable role in the the aggregation and deployment of catalytic capital. Um, so it really it's it's important to take kind of an ecosystem perspective to catalytic capital and really uh, highlight and celebrate the role of those specific set of players in matchmaking and sort of finding economies of scale and 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 how the the capital is is deployed to greatest impact. So I'm sorry if that if I, I've just uh, stolen your point, Sam, but that's the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> No, not at all. I, I like hearing it from you rather than saying it about myself. That's nicer. It's nicer coming back at me. But I was really struck. Maybe I'll take a step back and first say that one of the commonalities across all of this is that many of us has, have been working in these fields for so long. And it just feels um, celebratory that it's happening. <laughs> you know, when I started Prime, there were less than 10 program related investments ever made to any area of science and engineering innovation. And so to now have the privilege of being on a webinar where there are professionals that have done this at a large scale across many cause areas, across many geographies is just, it, it gives me, it kind of fortifies me and gives me the confidence to keep, to keep going. There's a lot of work left to do, but um, one commonality I think is just, um, a shared sense of how hard this is, but how worthy it is and how much promise and like the scale of promise in catalytic capital overall. The second one I noticed is the one that Michael already named. Maybe I'll be a little bit more precise and say that both Priya and Shoshana's specific slide about the need for an intermediary, we could have lifted that and put it into a prime um, pitch deck. Um, you know, Shijana's slide where she had the different arrows coming in and then different forms of investment and technical assistance coming out. Um, I can share in the chat, I wrote, I wrote an op-ed in 2023 that named almost those exact same important roles that an intermediary plays. And then what I'm hearing from our colleagues that deploy catalytic capital in India um, actually, within the last nine months, one of Prime's existing U.S.-based private foundation philanthropic partners that had participated in our like very U.S. domestic focused catalytic capital funds came to me and said that they wanted to replicate that same structure for India-based fund managers. And so we just recently published a report about all of the complexity um, that U.S. and EU-based philanthropists bump up against when they have this um, intention to deploy their capital for India-based uh, fund managers and facilities. And so maybe we could share that in the chat. Um, but again, one of the findings was that a U.S.-based public charity can help lower those, those kind of cross-border challenges. So um, just to get like even a little more granular about the commonalities of the importance of intermediation and like the specific types of things that um, can be costly and challenging and prevent this from happening at the scale that we all want it to. And thanks for that. So, I mean, I, I also, you know, throw that out to the uh, other uh, panelists as well, or Hermie and Stacey from the, the consortium, if there's anything you, you'd like to add for that while we're warming up. And thank you, Greta, for, for the question. We'll, we may come to that in a second. I just saw popping up. But I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that uh, call for commonalities or not. And I'm not pressing anyone, but just in case. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I just, oh, sorry. <laughs> No, no, I think Suzanne and Priya both said yep. they might respond. So I'm going yeah, to I'm, I'm, no, I'm just really happy about what Sarah highlighted. And maybe you can put this piece of yours in the chat. And uh, and so, yeah, it's it's very interesting how how this kind of recognition comes up from very, very different contexts uh, and um, in such a similar way. So. 
also like to add to Susanna's uh, and uh, Sarah's point that uh, one of the struggles that we are facing with a lot of investors, especially with diaspora or even international investors wanting to invest uh, in enterprises is uh, the legal challenges. And if there is a way to sort of navigate that, uh, I think there is an ecosystem. Uh, and honestly, it's a demand supply problem right now. There are far too many enterprises who actually want to engage with the capital ecosystem and do not know how to engage with the capital ecosystem and want, and there are enough investors, not just from outside India, but also from within India who want to understand how to engage with an ecosystem like the creative manufacturing and handmade. And cultural economy and creative industries are a very, very new area of expertise, but it is growing across the world especially across global majority countries. So if catalytic capital comes in and we are, if we are able to also not just deliver capital, but also deliver better metrics for measuring the impact of capital, I think that is where we can really uh, make a difference. Uh, and I think that is also the need uh, from a lot of investors that we are seeing across e the ecosystem. And when I say investors, I mean funders, I mean, traditional investors, I also mean catalytic investors, but a lot of people are also first time investors. So a lot of alternative financing platforms are also emerging in India. And I think there is merit in wanting to somewhere, you know, create metrics that are very specific, that are regional, that are, uh, are also sector specific, which we currently don't have, uh, I think, at least in what we are operating with. And uh, yeah, thank you. And um, Amit, did you have something you'd like to add to that? Or uh, no, Peter. Actually, I'll just yep. wait for uh, my comments at the end. I was going to talk oh. about intermediaries <laughs> <laughs> at that point, so let's just hold it. And go with the panelists and the other questions. <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, in that case, should we, um, Greta? You, you mentioned that it might be easier to ask. If you're feeling brave enough to uh, switch on a camera or ask a question, uh, feel free. And we'll thank you for being the first to get the, uh, the ball rolling as well. It's always appreciated. No, thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure to hear from all of the panelists. <laughs> so many um, really great insights in a short amount of time. So maybe two quick questions that um, then you can come back to. So Peter, uh, so for the first one, Michael, was to you. You had mentioned and um, and that when you did the survey, you had to frame it as uh, the definition applied um, uh, by uh, C3 of what catalytic capital was, and then they realized that they were doing certain um, components of uh, catalytic capital. The question to you was, um, were they surprised or was it, what kind of was that follow on of interest or engagement, wanting to do more, curious about the community um, or, you know, you know, kind of just that, that maybe that dialogue, if you could share some insights there. The second question um, was to Sarah um, and maybe any of the other panelists. Uh, you know, especially since you've been there since the beginning, I was wondering your thoughts on um, if you had already tried to engage also with um, donor advised funds or um, some of the other uh, fiscal sponsor organizations, because I think you, you made a great point about how intermediaries often serve as a, a place to, um, in terms of US regulations for pooling funding um, in order to a de you deploy it in across countries where there might be more challenges from a regulation perspective. So we'd love your thoughts on, on those two pieces. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, so I think there may be two parts to your question. Uh, so first of all, in terms of the dynamics of the survey, um, we, we don't really know what the reaction was because it was it wasn't an interview based survey. Like we weren't talking to the um, fund managers as they were taking the survey, they were presented with the definition of catalytic capital per C3. And, and then um, if they confirm that they practice catalytic capital, then they received um, a, a subsequent set of questions. And we were not sort of in the room as that was happening. So we couldn't really gauge their, their reactions to being sent down that path in the survey. Um, but I also did mention, and this might be what your question is referring to, uh, we did a number of follow-up interviews with um, with uh, 20 or so respondents 
who did uh, fall into that continuum of, of catalytic capital engagement. Um, and their reaction was, um, I mean, there was no reaction like, oh, I didn't mean to self-identify as catalytic. They all can, you know, affirm that they they do indeed practice catalytic capital. Um, one of the the interesting aspects of those interviews that I didn't really get a chance to talk about in the presentation is that in addition to the importance of additionality, there was just a very broad understanding of catalytic capital. For 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 better or worse, you know, catalytic capital is already somewhat of a contested term in the impact investing space. So it's uh, it's interesting, but also sometimes. Uh, a little bit perplexing to find that people are still interpreting it in very different ways. But it was also, but you know, for the purposes of the interview, it was just interesting to see how capacious this this term is. And, and one, for example, one thing that several respondents or several interviewees brought up was that they see field building, basically what we're doing right now, as an important aspect of catalytic capital. That is, in addition to making deals and and furthering along investments, catalytic capital involves um, sharing lessons learned and best practices with other practitioners in the space. So that was kind of an interesting nuance to their understanding of catalytic capital in the interviews. I hope that answers your question. And Greta, your question about donor advised funds and fiscal sponsors is so prescient and timely. Um, the back, the context at Prime is, is that we've had completed grant and recoverable grant transactions and equity subscriptions with 30 different donor advised fund sponsors. And so what I'm about to say both comes from our personal experience um, and now from our kind of keen observation of what's happening in the market today. Um, having a convener that can allow donor advised fund clients that ha have their DAFs held at different sponsors is critically important. It's almost like the intermediary becomes the advocate to help the DAF sponsor proceed. <laughs> um, there are about five DAF sponsors in the US that have been purpose built to specialize in impact investing. Um, but then that brings me to fiscal sponsor because what we've learned is that the downsides of working or moving your DAF to that sponsor is very similar to the high cost version of a fiscal sponsor in that there is no cause specific um, additionality or impact measurement and management expertise, um, which as you heard from Shoshana and Priya, it's like we can't expect a donor advised fund sponsor to be expert at housing in a, in a small region in Eastern Europe and also um, galvanizing all different types of artisans in different parts of a supply chain in all different regions of India. And so just on the topic of fiscal sponsor, I think there's low cost options that give no pre or post investment service, which can be very problematic. And then there's high cost options, which again, don't come with this kind of capital gap or cause specific um, expertise required by thoughtful catalytic capital deployment around additionality and impact measurement and management. Um, so all of that is to say, I think I think the donor advised fund sponsor community has evolved in a very um, interesting way over the last 10 years. I really like organizations like CapShift that are also working on getting kind of impact investments out. I think there's quite a lot of opportunity for um, thoughtful catalytic capital intermediation in that context. And in fact, CapShift is constantly like, Prime, can you please be our nonprofit sponsor? Recoverable grants are the easiest on-ramp for DAF clients to start doing this. And um, you need a nonprofit to be able to, to do that. Exactly. And Thank you for, for that question. And also, I saw a question in the in the chat from oh, lost it, Kathy. I, I won't ask that now, but but I'm happy to share that question with the the, the speakers, and and I'm sure they'll be able to come back to you uh, directly um, if that uh, appeals. And uh, a trip to Baku and COP twenty nine. Um, and so I I just thought um, the other thing that I'll thank Greta for is it gave me a moment to come up with a smart sounding question. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a question uh, really to to maybe to Jeshri or um, the, the other panelists. Um, 
like the title of this webinar when we set it up was about leveraging capital to capital and it sounded good when we put it on the on the on the slide um i just wondered like both from your kind of project experiences or or even from what you're hearing today what would you say if you're putting on the spot a little bit would be like the biggest opportunity for us to do that if we're kind of doing it uh, i warned you it was a, a smart sounding question <laughs> It's a very smart question. It's a very good question, actually. Um, so there are a couple of things. I mean, ideally, I think there are five pathways to maximizing catalytic capital's leveraging power. In an ideal world, we'd want DFIs to do that because at least in the inclusive finance space, that's what they're set up to do. They're meant to provide catalytic capital. They're meant to measure the additionality, but they don't. And so the onus of that, I mean, for a number of reasons, they don't. Um, so the onus of that then falls on smaller impact first investors uh, where the size is often really small. And so they, uh, so there are inefficiencies that creep in. So the first opportunity is to bring together in some way um, these smaller impact first investors and really help them to design um, their investment tools in a way where the incentives are aligned to make sure that uh, you know they can they can catalyze investments but that you know like i said from our research that doesn't just mean bringing in more funds that's you know pretty obvious from what they're meant to do but it also means um creating enabling infrastructure and there is a role for um i i guess uh, players like C3 to, to make sure that that, in, that enabling infrastructure is created. So in the digital credit world, it could be you know, the creation of credit bureaus, making sure that there's adequate reporting, liaising with uh, regulators. Um, M-Pesa, for instance, you know, which I spoke about, is often not thought about as critical infrastructure, but it is because it enables access to digital payments for a large segment of the Kenyan population. Um, the second is you know, building responsible practices within the inv investee. And, um, in a way that that can become market best practice. So that means working with industry associations to make sure that some of this messaging is elevated. And because these catalytic investors are currently so small and so focused on just getting in follow on funding, they often don't have the bandwidth to work with industry associations and build the, the voice for that. Um, and there is a need to create a consortium of follow on local investors, particularly in more risky markets, or as I hear Priya and Susanna speak, you know, also for riskier segments. Um, and there's a need to work closely with partners who can then help quantify and address these risk perceptions. So some of that can be done with, you know, through credit rating agencies, but there's a lot more of um, I don't know, uh, you know, there's a lot more talking that needs to be done about, you know, what is happening through the catalytic capital investment. And I think this has been mentioned earlier, which is a big part of the catalytic investment that's not measured, is how do we measure the influence of the, you know, the broader ecosystem and the impact that it helps build. Um, and that's not, that's not easy to measure, and it, it doesn't happen in the short term. So how, you know, who can help us do that over an extended period of time? I mean, just briefly speaking from the position of someone working at a network, the idea of how the broader ecosystem impacts are measured is something we struggle with just full stop. Sometimes you, you end up just believing that the magic is happening, but it would be lovely to somehow quantify it and, and definitely share it more widely. So, yeah, just from a, a personal point of view, that, that very much resonated. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, uh, Susanna, if you had um, any thoughts on the same kind of question of opportunities? Yes, well, in our case, we really think uh, from the perspective of building uh, models and building uh, structures that uh, don't currently exist or are not able to scale up. And so from this perspective, I think uh, the leveraging power of catalytic capital is really about um, enabling this kind of upscaling and uh, model building um, because there are so many actors and private actors and also public ones in, in the case of Central and Eastern Europe which are unwilling to to enter as long as it's not proven, you know, in a way. And uh, so I think this initial role of catalytic capital could be really, really valuable um, because then once this leverage is created, uh, at least in the case of what I was talking about, the sector of um, uh, affordable rental and cooperative housing, and we can see this from various international examples. Once it's proven, then it it starts, you know, it becomes this rolling ball that everyone wants to jump on. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, but in the beginning you really need these kind of pioneering actors and i think it could be similar for other sectors where there is a viable business model there is just um you know this kind of um, lack of imagination or lack of trust uh, or lack of um, pioneering incentive let's say so in this case it's it's really really a leverage that i i see that is missing so and yeah the, the pioneering approach uh, we, we've got pioneers on the on the panel we just need a few more elsewhere um and so i can see priya do you have some thoughts on this as well i saw oh uh honestly i think the more we engage with the language of catalytic capital and we try to uh engage not just with the enterprises but also with the investment ecosystem um what i think what i'd like to foreground is the fact that um we can't take a copy paste approach there is no way you can take a copy paste approach to catalytic capital because the way it works in india is no matter i mean if we had the option of fiscal sponsorship as an idea even in india uh you know we a lot of us would thrive but we don't um and the fact that what was interesting when in our mapping was that do we were mapping for profit enterprises who required something as simple as working capital you know and just debt financing um the fact that a lot of them had to set up a non profit just for capacity building of a 600 million audience so an enterprise is only one part of the ecosystem they are trying to support an ecosystem of informal workers which is 600 million people in india which is fascinating frankly because these are people i mean just put yourself in their shoes these are people who do not have these are women working out of villages which means the work they can't and something that i mean i wish i could speak about and i wish havi was here and i think havi was one of the few people who actually havi ko was one of the few people who actually addressed it in his article that you know an enterprise we assume that an enterprise is built in a certain way an enterprise has is you know there's a factory that happens there are people who come and work from 9 to 5 this is one of the few ecosystems in the world and i don't mean india alone you can map it in africa you can map it in southeast asia you can map it in south uh, south america the work goes to the community because 50% of the community is women who can't move out of their homes to actually go and work in a factory which means the business model has to be customized to the needs of the community which is what we sort of defined as new formal because the factory setup might actually not be the future actually in countries like us uh and that and therefore capital is very interesting because suddenly now we are getting interest from not just the enterprises the enterprises are reaching out to us and these are people who can have access to anywhere between say 10 to 50000 artisans and when i say 50000 artisans if 50000 artisans want working capital they don't have access to it because 50% of them are women or chances are they don't have collateral which means bank on banks can't engage with them which means there is an opportunity for catalytic capital to move in and for nbfcs to move in now the biggest and if somebody in this room wants to build a solution around it please do we are looking so what the reason why microfinance became so big in the ecosystem at one point was because it was delivering finance at a certain sort of uh, ticket size i'm saying right now in india if we can deliver capital under 10% especially debt capital under 10% we are looking at a massive 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 ecosystem and a supply and a demand ecosystem that is willing to take that capital as of today if you're willing to offer it today the banks are not in a position to offer it today which means who is offering it today and that is one of the challenges and that is also an opportunity for capital capital to capital providers to open up the market to people who are not currently engaging with the capital ecosystem 88% self financing is a 
problem from a capital ecosystem perspective we are saying that these are people who are not even engaging with the capital ecosystem you know and we are talking about a country as big as india with a few billion people i mean at, at least 1.4 billion people let's put it that way <laughs> uh, and that is where i think the opportunity lies and mm-hmm. if there is a way for many stakeholders to come and again to the point of many uh, what many others have raised we need intermediaries because this is language that is new and it was also sector specific it is also country specific unfortunately and what we would like to engage with is to actually figure out how this can be solved for because if we can deliver debt under 10% or even under 12% in uh, the sector that we are operating in that is gold we are looking at the mm. new microfinance revolution i can promise you that much <laughs> well on that small small scale uh, ambition which I, I think is very very relevant i can see it really... only finding yeah exactly okay. so I, i'll just hand over to Ernie <laughs> to to lead the way into this new revolution um i don't know if there's, if there's comments you'd like to like to add Ernie, as we we look to close up here Yeah yeah thank you Peter I I really really appreciated the conversation and of course at this point I'm like if only we had a few minutes more uh, but I know that even the few minutes would not do much for us um I want to just uh, share a few thoughts the first one being a big thank you to the panelists for making this happen several of you had big conflicting engagements today one of you is joining in from a public place because you had some challenges with access to electricity and the internet uh i know the impact your team has been scrambling to get all of this set up um so really acknowledging um our, our sort of gratitude for everything that you all have done and and you know this work i think you all applied for opportunities to get these grants back in 20 and 21 um so it's been a long long journey um but but much thanks to all of you and a big thank you to the folks that have joined in uh and i know that the recording um and the slides will be available afterwards um on on c3's work uh, you know you heard snippets of some of that uh, sort of priorities from stacy and others uh, we have tried to do a range of different uh projects uh, and supports for the ecosystem along the spectrum of needs for investors i think you heard about how investors are at different stages and they may be looking for support in doing different things sometimes it is hand holding getting them introduced to to particular uh, sectoral opportunities sometimes it's creating the right structures that we heard of from people sometimes it's helping them navigate the investment post the initial approval process and understanding how to think about scale and impact um and the one thing that is clear from all of this is that it's a very very messy set of needs and uh and i think it needs all of us uh, in different roles playing different functions uh to help meet those needs um and i think that investor education engagement uh is a part of everybody's job even if that is not what we explicitly set out to do in you know whatever we are doing in the catalytic capital ecosystem so i i think that's a big shout out to all of you what we did hear from our various cohorts of uh grantees and partners including the ones that are uh, uh colleagues to this cohort of evidence based grantees are uh, subsequent partners and then all the impact investing networks globally that we have tried to support in their catalytic capital programming including impact europe is that um that investor education training engagement is a very big need and the more we can structure resources and provide some of that uh, to folks the more we can help push that along um so so i would urge all of you to keep thinking about this question of what can we do uh, to make our work Uh, reach more investors educate more folks and get more conversations going in different circles uh, you know not everything will lead to an investment you know in in sort of time t plus 1 but uh, i think that that's the journey we want to start uh, different folks on the other thing that jumped out to, uh, to me when we were walking through the presentations is that there is a range of needs that catalytic capital meets and it's very very powerful in what sort of impact it creates um you know jayshri and uh, um susanna and and priya actually to some extent all talked about opportunities where there is a what we call a sustaining role for catalytic capital where the need for 
flexibility and a stronger risk appetite is going to be ongoing because the market economics don't really lend themselves to getting commercial capital, even when you reach scale or you demonstrate the models. Whereas I think where Priya is in many, uh, where uh, Sarah is working in many of the cases, you are kind of looking to take different um, enterprises to scale in what they're doing so far as sort of climate related solutions are concerned. And, and the power of catalytic capital is that it's relevant in all of those markets. Uh, so it's really important for us to call out the role it plays. Uh, the other piece that sort of sits around all of this is this complication around ecosystem, regulations, infrastructure, all of which then influence how quickly or easily or effectively you can deploy this capital when it is at the table. Um, and in that uh, in that sense, uh, you know, when we started C3, we said we would take a global remit and we would not pick particular sectors. We would try to look at the role of catalytic capital across markets and sectors. And, uh, you know, what that has sort of revealed to us is, of course, the power of catalytic capital consistently to be seen across different markets and sectors, but also the complexity of the challenge. So I, I think that we, uh, we kind of need to acknowledge that and, and really... Um, identify where and how we can be most effective with the resources we have, because I think I think the the overall picture is always uh, complex and always very demanding. The two other quick points, and then I will wrap up and hand back to Peter. One, um, the question of intermediaries came up, and you know, Prime's work kind of really illustrated the opportunity and the need, in some ways, to help educate intermediaries about how to how to think about uh, their fund offerings as responding to a catalytic capital opportunity and need. And uh, and the work that uh, Michael and team did then got us a lot of input from a range of impact investing fund managers all over the world, right? And that uh, maybe a lot of them were concentrated in originating in the US and Europe, but the markets they looked at were across emerging and developed markets. And um, I think what we are hearing anecdotally as well from C3's own work in various uh, activities that we have supported is the need to, to really give the right tools to intermediaries to think and talk about catalytic capital. Because uh, I think in, in the effort to bridge the gap between investors and the demand opportunity, intermediaries play uh, an absolutely critical role. And the more we can think about structured consistent ways to uh, equip them with the with the right tools to make that connection happen, I think the further along all of this will get. And then the last piece I would say is that, you know, I spoke about investor engagement sitting at the heart of what we all need to do when we're talking about catalytic capital or working on it. I think the other piece um, that uh, for us was interesting coming out of the work that CFI and Jayashree's team did was really about thinking about the role for advocacy and being responsible about market development implications of bringing this capital to the table. You know, we are constantly talking about figuring out the right size, the right terms, the right subsidy. Uh, and all of this, I think, is really geared towards helping make sure that market development and scale, when it does happen, happens in a responsible way, happens in a way that continues to put the ha you know, put at the heart the needs of the communities rather than other interests that can creep in. So, so I think all of these uh, projects are very, very diverse. At the same time, there are these common threads. Um, Priya mentioned the work that Harvey Co, um, our advisor, uh, has done. Uh, maybe Stacy can drop in to the chat the links to two pieces: one in Impact Alpha and one at SSIR. Uh, that uh, he worked with us to put out talking about the whole cohort of grants and projects that came with this evidence-based work. And then the other piece I would draw your attention to is that on the other side of investors thinking about these questions, um, we had a series of uh, blogs that came out of our learning labs uh, that uh, leading impa uh, impact investing practitioners in catalytic capital had put out. In Impact Alpha, this happened on the back of some um, cohorts that we had uh, put together earlier. These are uh, can all be found on the Impact Alpha site, and we'll share that link to the Catalytic Capital blogs there as well. So with that, I am going to stop. I know we are already a minute past our time. Uh, big thank you to everybody, and uh, you know, please sign up for the newsletter for C3 and and more to come from 
all the amazing work our partners are doing. Thank you. With that, I will wave you all a goodbye as well. Thank you very much for joining us. We will follow up with emails and feedback forms as always. Please fill them out. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.